Hey everybody, welcome to the inaugural episode of Works in Progress with Frank Fredella. I'm your host, Frank Fredella, doing the Frank Fredella thing here with uh, some very good friends of mine. Now, before I kick it over to my guests, uh, just a quick note about what the show is. If you're stumbling across this for the first time, it could be six months down the line. We've done a dozen shows, three dozen shows by now. You don't know. So today is our first show, and what the show is about, it's about artists and the art way of life. It's, it's about the human beings living an artistic life. So the, the title Works in Progress refers to not only the works they have on their, on their easel or, or, or digital canvas, it's about the artist as a work in progress. And um, I'm a mindset coach and an artist myself, so these are two of the topics that fascinate me. And this show would not be here today if it were not for our first guest. I'm going to introduce them right now. Chris Malador and Delphine Levesque de Mers. Am I saying that right? <laughs> yes, Levesque de Mers. That's fine. Leve- I like your Levesque accent. Levesque de Mers. Oh, Ooh. <laughs> it's when you say it like that, I suddenly I become very Gomez Adamish. Like I want to kiss up your arm. It's te- <laughs> like it's I'm I'm crazy like that. So guys, hi! Thanks so much for being the first guests on the show. Hi. Hello. Hey. So We're happy to Delphine, be here. I'm- I'm kicking it over to you to start, Delphine, because you're the one who slid into my DMs and you were like, "Bit, you have to make a show. I like, you smacked the shit out of you, yeah. Smacked the shit out of me with a croissant and a baguette. And it was, <laughs> it was all very French and sexy. Um, like and, a French and somebody, the <laughs> See, so why? Why, why did you insist on doing this? I don't know. I was watching your... Um, your kind of um, interview things that you were doing the, uh, how do you call this? You were doing a uh, kind of a coaching interview. Yes. Not too long ago. And I was watching it and I was like, uh, by, by looking at you and how you talked and all that, I was like, he should be the one doing the interview because he's got so much things to, to say. And I don't know, like I could see the potential. You know? <laughs> like I wanted to be interviewed by you. We you. Well, we well, your wish has come true. Here we are um, yeah. in the thick of it. You're in the lion's den now. So I'm just going to go for the jugular here. I, I want to talk about you two first um, as artists, because you're both phenomenal artists. I'm, I'm huge fans of both of your work. Mm-hmm. And uh, specifically, I want to I mention the contribution that you've both been to me as an artist. Um, I, uh, I've been an amateur kind of kick the tires artist for a really long time and never really made the big push into doing it professionally. Uh, but I got a bee in my bonnet a couple of years back and I wanted to do this 78 tarot thing that I saw come across my, my, my field of vision. And I was like, how do I do that? And like I do with everything, I just ask, can I do that please? You showed the fuck up. That's what you did. <laughs> it showed the fuck up. In my DM, that was you. <laughs> you did that's it right. first. It was, I did. I started this whole thing. It's all my fault. <laughs> you touched um, me first. <laughs> Ooh, I'll tell you that. This kid's sexually inappropriate. All right. So <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I slid into Delphine's DMs. I knew that she was the art director for the 78 Tarot. And and my big thing is that people can always say no, but I'm always happy to ask the question. Can I do this? This is something I want to do. Can I do this? How do I do this? What would it take for me to do this with you? And at the time you were like, we, we're full. We're totally full. There's no room for you here. And that's, that was the, and then the 11th hour, somebody drops out and they're like, put on your cleats, bitch. You're in. And I was like, <laughs> go, go. <laughs> yes. Like I, I, back then when I was doing the, the art direction for that project, like some people always contact us and all that. And I, uh, you know, I had my little list in the, in the corner, you know, like I keep people warm in a little corner like that. And you were one of my first, uh, first choice there. Well, I'm super grateful for it because it set me on an artistic path the last couple of years that has been unprecedented in my life. You know, connecting me with so many other artists um, is, is the number really really my foundation for wanting to do the show because over the last couple of years, the artists that I've met through the 78 Tarot and the friendships and relationships that I found there and the home that I found inside the artistic community is unlike anything else I've experienced before. Um, It's an incredibly kind, generative space. Everybody's willing to help and talk about their work and and talk about the struggle. And I was like, 
I, I want to do this. I want to talk about this more. And um, I, I got to give a shout out to my boy Chris here because I, man, I, on that first deck, I choked, I choked hard. And like, <laughs> I kept going to Chris and I'm like, dude, I can't, I, I have forgotten how to hold the pencil. I'm so lost at this point. I don't know. I, and like, and that was this whole thing, right? Chris came, came to me in a space of non-judgment, right? And he was just like, okay, well, let's just address the thing, man. What is it? Right. And he's like, he addressed not only the, the, and I, honestly, I don't know that you ever actually addressed any of the problems with the art, of which there were many. What you talked to me about was my mindset about how to approach the art and how to get back in the game, how to get back in the batter's box and take that next swing. I do you remember that conversation? I absolutely do. And the thing is, that's what holds up most artists when they're struggling. Yes, there's technical things, but it's a mindset thing first. I was taught a long time ago when I was doing martial arts that when you start tensing up and getting super stressed out about what you're doing, you're actually locking off blood flow to your brain. So the idea is to suddenly cool that down, release the neck muscles, allow your mind to function better, and suddenly you're going to start thinking of solutions. And so it was important for me to try and get you calmed down enough to be like, all right, maybe I'm being the problem here. How do I fix that? And let's move on now because I'm wasting time. Yeah. And, and it, 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 was Brazil, it was brilliant facilitation, right? Because like, uh, in, instead of him kind of like I, what I was afraid of, right? Because I was, I was new to all this and he was a veteran and you're a veteran Delphine and you, you're the art director. I was just like, I can't choke on this. If I do this badly, I'm never doing another art thing again. Nobody will ever look at my art. They'll spit on it in the street. Young children will laugh at me. Dogs will urinate on my feet while I it just, it's going to be terrible. Like nothing good comes of this. If I can't do this piece of art, this one piece of art. <laughs> I love and I'd, I started the thing as a watercolor and I'm like, I'm going to do this. This is going to be my thing. And I've never completed an actual complete scene in watercolor before. I don't know why I thought this was going to be the time. I ended up taking it into digital and finishing it that way. And still, one of the things that held me back was what if it's no good when I'm done? What if it is? Exactly. You never know. Ask her right. art director. <laughs> She'll let you right. know. So, so the thing that held me back, though, was that like I was procrastinating on finishing the piece because it couldn't be terrible if I wasn't finished with it yet. Exactly. What the hell is that? We art, do that a lot. Art, Artists do that all the fucking time. Art failure begins in the mind. Yeah. And because we self-sabotage, all of us, it's very human to do so. I would all, all the time. I mean, I've been doing this for how long now? 17-ish years. I mean, I still run into this problem. Oh, yeah. You know, she runs into this problem. It's, all the time. We're all contributing to that in our own way. And the idea is we have to find ways around it. And over time, you find little habits that you can do to bring it back in. But if in your case, someone who maybe doesn't have the same background and experience in finding their way through that storm, sometimes someone just has to maybe point them through it a little bit. So. Yeah. And, and Delphine was incredibly encouraging about the art when I submitted my, my work in progress. Right. <laughs> and and, and this is for this. The seven eight tarot carnival, right? That was like exactly was like the seven yeah, the strong them. man on the stage with the with the yeah, 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 and yeah. like the tortures and pitchforks, right? Yeah, and like <laughs> I loved I love the concept, and like yeah. every now and then, like when I'm in my art folder, um, one of the things that I've been doing more over these last few months is realizing how much I've leveled up since that, and to say what can I do with this now? Can I take this back into into Photoshop, can I bring it back to the drawing board? How would I fix this now? And I'll spend an hour or two here and there just kind of touching up old projects just for me. Um, do you guys ever do this? Is this unique to me or? It's actually funny you mentioned that. Last year we started brainstorming, what, how would we reapproach this picture from say a decade ago? Exactly. With the same art prompt, with a more uh, modern take kind of thing. And I don't mean modern as in, Humanity is modern. I just mean 10 years further down the yeah. line, I think differently. With, she thinks differently. With all the skills, too, that we've built over the years, I mean, uh, pieces that we were proud of back in the days, now we look at, at them and we're like, what the fuck is wrong with the neck or the hands? 
Like what the hell? Even even the the portraits that I've been doing lately, like if I look at my very first ones and the one I'm doing now, I'm like, <laughs> like right. How did I got paid for that shit? <laughs> so it's now at a point where we're starting to readdress those a little bit here and there as we get free time, mm -hmm. whatever that is, and um, start to maybe revisit them. Maybe someday we can do a book out of them. Yes. But mostly it's even just self-exploration and just seeing mm -hmm. what it can be. And it doesn't have to serve more of a purpose than that because mm -hmm. it's just being an artist. Yeah. Right. So I... I um. And b before I go any further, I want to let you know that uh, whenever you're watching this, if you check the show notes, there's going to be links to both uh, Delphine's and Chris's art pages, um, because you have to see the skill level that we're talking about here. And um, somewhere in there, if you dig in far enough, you're going to find some of the earlier works that they're talking about, because these are veterans. Um, like, I've been drawing since I was a kid. I'm 52 years old now. I had, prior to the 78 uh, Carnival, I had one professional art credit, and I was the artist and author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Drawing. And it was aptly named because I was a complete idiot for taking the job. I had no business being out. <laughs> right. Right, just and no you took business. the risk. Right, uh, I, like for, for me, it's like, you know, you jump off a cliff and you learn how to fly on the way down. That's, that's kind of how I've approached things. It's why I've got so many broken bones. <laughs> Stop, there so, we go. Gentle <laughs> to your bones. So I, you know, the 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 amazing thing is that having having worked on several of those decks now and watching my own art progress through that, and my art progressed because of the community. Like there's there's no other way to look at this is that like I I got inspired by the people that I was working with, and I I looked at the art that, that you guys were producing and I said I want to do I want to do more I want to be I want to get better I want to I want to belong here. Like, I, I don't want to feel like I'm, I've, I've kind of shown somebody a fake ID at the door and you guys are just being kind and letting me in. Like, I wanted to feel like I'd earned my place. And, and um, I don't typically like to function from a place of needing to be worthy of something because that, that's a judgment, right? Whether or not you're worthy. Um, exactly. And so as, as I brought my coaching business along, my art, biz, my art skills grew too because I stopped being judgmental of my work. In a, in a negative sense. I started being aware of the work and where it could closer match the vision I had for it. Does that make sense? I wasn't looking at it as yeah. this is bad or this is good and this is right and this is wrong. It was simply, I had a vision for this thing. How close am I to that vision now? And what can I do to get closer? Right. Do you guys still judge your work? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> try to be more objective than subjective but the reality is is we're just artists we're all yeah. human and we're gonna be like you know what there's That's crap there's always what something, can i do better you know there's and, always something yeah. new to learn every single fucking painting is a new challenge it's a new story i mean unless you're reproducing the same shit over and over and over again but like when i do my portrait it's a different face it's a different person different um you know, type of skin, hair, eyes, uh, emotions. So yeah, yeah okay. no, I, mean, so I want to talk to you about these portraits of yours because um, when you started doing the portraits, I was blown away first of all, and then you're like, guys, I'm gonna start doing pet portraits. I've never done them before, <laughs> and I'm like, what? I, what? I was I that? was getting message from people. They're like, hey, can you paint my cat? I'm like, yeah. do I look like I paint cats? It, uh, to me, at first, I was like, it's like asking a, a dentist to fix your hair, you know, like, that's not what I do. And then I'm like, whoa, wait, wait, why, why not try him? Why isn't it what you do? Right? No. I mean, yeah. and, so I and, tried. And now the, it's like one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, the results of those pet portraits were mind-bogglingly good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, everybody's like have so many attachment to their own pets and all that. And I'm like, you know, this, this is, this is something that would be great to just be able to, to, to provide for these people. Cause like, I mean, who doesn't want a beautiful portrait of their pets? You know, sometimes the pets are more loved than people. <laughs> so like, so what, what I really want to talk about, 
uh, beyond the work, what I really want to talk about here is your willingness to fail. Right? Oh yeah. Like oh yeah. I, I had no idea how it's gonna how it was gonna go, but I, I knew if I didn't took the risk, I would never know. So I fucking tried it and uh you know I I believed in you know with all the stuff I've been painting, I'm like of course a pet it's got hair and it's different it's got, it's got a different anatomy you know than a, a a human let's just say but at the same time i the more i started doing those pets the more i i, I realized they really do have like an an expression to just like people you know you can you can see if the pet seems happy or if the pet seems chill or if the pet's a stoner or whatever <laughs> <laughs> like i started seeing the expression and i'm like that is really cool of course, the eyes are made differently, but I was able to put all that nice little emotions and, and, and feelings into the pets too. So with that, I'm good. It's like, that's what I like to do. You know, I like to paint something that's alive. <laughs> so, like so yeah, so this is fascinating for me, right? Because like one of the things that I struggled, not struggled with, I worked really hard on last year was getting better at likenesses. Mm -hmm. And you become very aware very quickly of the, the, the ratios and distances and, and proportions yeah. of everything in relation to each other. Because if you get any of that wrong, it kind of looks like the person, but then you're like, oh, you're yeah. so close. Well, so I don't close. do portraits. <laughs> right, but it's the, it's the kind of thing where like, if you get it wrong, everybody knows immediately, right? Oh yeah. If, if, if you're not hitting the mark, you get it wrong immediately. And then it's I was like, Pets, this is fantastic. Yeah, I was like, well, pets is fantastic. Who's going to notice? Their owners are going to notice. Yes, exactly. You know, when I do a pet, I don't just draw like the breed of it. Like, like let's do, let, let's do a, uh, uh, I don't know, like a, uh, tell me a breed, <laughs> like a, a dog kind, like, oh, like a, a German, German shepherd. shepherd. I'm not just going to Google German shepherd and like draw that thing. No, no, it needs to be the, put that emotion, that little thing that the owner of the pet, you know, uh, the spirit, you know, the soul, put the fucking soul on paper. Right, but this, this. The personality, yeah. yeah. And this, this goes beyond art skill, right? This is, you're not, now you're a fucking medium, right? Like now you're like channeling the spirit of the animal and putting it into the artwork. I mean, this is <laughs> phenomenal. Spirit animal. No, I mean, uh, I try to do my very best because I know it's, it's so meaningful to these people. Uh, of course I get paid for it. I mean, that's how I make a living, but I also, you know, try to give back, if that makes sense. You know, I really want it to be a special present, a special gift, something to, you know, pets don't live, live as long as humans, you know, so like, um, it's going to be a great little tribute for them to, to put on their walls, you know, or, so yeah. I really try to do my absolute best and capture that emotion, that personality, the soul. I, I, I want to talk, hair. I want to talk quickly about something that occurs early on in some uh well okay so back in 1999 i started a magazine called cyber age adventures and i used to commission artists um so one of the things that that happened um was that i wasn't paying very much because i was paying out of pocket and the magazine was free so it was just costing me money every month but i wanted at least one spot illustration per per issue right um one of the things that I found with artists who were still kind of trying to break in was that they would, they would take the job for the money that I was offering. But at some point there was a mental shift where they were like, for the amount of money I, I'm getting paid, I'm going to stop here. Oh yeah. Right. And so it, but that always to me seemed short sighted because like at the end of the day, when people see your art, they don't know how much I paid you. They just know you did bad art. Exactly. I was given advice once from, you know, I, I work primarily in the gaming field with my work. And I was given advice one, one day from a, a peer and he said, you know, this body of work will represent you. This is your business card. And it doesn't even matter about the book. You're going to display this on your website. Ten years from now, someone might find this in a used bookshop or something. And they don't care if the publisher's even around anymore, they don't care about any of the fine details, but that picture is going to stick with them and it will affect the world they are building within their game. And my thought from there was, well, what world do I want to help them build when their sessions? And it was no longer about even the publisher or what I can do. 
It was about trying to now evoke a mood because you want to make sure they have the best gaming experience possible. It means I lose money on my projects sometimes because I throw in so much effort, yeah. but now it's more fun because you know you're helping someone with their game. Right. And this is phenomenal, so it's right? A, this is it's mindset, you know? Yeah, lots of artists are givers, you know? Like, um, you know, people are asking me often, how much, do I, how much time do we spend yeah. on our art and stuff? I'm like, I don't know. And I don't, I don't want to calculate how much I'm getting paid per hour because yeah. they're paying for a project, a, a, a result, you know? And yes, sometimes we will spend like, whoa! <laughs> phone, phone down! Phone down! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Please hold. Chills, thrills, action. It's all here, folks. It's Our phone setting is shit. There we go. Yeah, yeah now my, uh, my tripod doesn't like this phone. It's going to happen. It's because he's so hot, the phone's like, oh. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. You're so hot. That's what it is. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yes. Uh, so when so, I was thinking. But this, this concept of over-delivering, I think, exemplifies both of you. Right, because you're you're not looking at this of like, okay, so how much money did I get paid, and how much time am I willing to devote to it? We end up spending like ten more hours, sometimes two, three more days than what we were supposed to, because the picture itself ended up being more challenging than yeah. we thought, or we really fucking wanted to look a certain way. I will never deliver a product to somebody unless I am one hundred percent satisfied. There's always something I could do better. Of course, you know you could. Go pick on to these little things, but uh, you know, I I just want to always deliver the best I can. And from a business standpoint, I also don't want to ding my publisher financially because my skill set might be lacking in something. Yeah. That's on me. That's not their problem. And if I can't deliver in a specific way because I suddenly forget how blue interacts with orange, you know, <laughs> well then I got to figure that out. You know, like and so I'm not going to put an extra for that. I love that. You know? <laughs> Forget how to interact with the <laughs> So I, I, I love that, you know, there's, there's always room for improvement, right? You're never, it's never going to oh, be wait. perfect, right? Never okay. going to be perfect. Um, but, I, but I like this thing where like, I'm not, it's not leaving my desk until I'm satisfied. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. And that's, I've that's dedication to the of craft. Them. And that, that speaks of a level of professionalism that I think is a key mindset <laughs> here in being successful as a, as a professional. It artist. develops over time. Yeah. It's, this was not an immediate mindset for me. It, you know, and probably not for her, I can't speak for her on that. Oh, but no, for I, me, like I yeah. let a lot of pictures out that maybe I really shouldn't have. And mm -hmm. now I'm at a different mindset than I was, you know, 10 years ago and whatever, where now I'm like, you know what, I need to make sure this ages well. Yeah. You know, it's not, I'm not just fulfilling a project and cashing in a contract. This is my body of work. Well, I started me. I started very young at 15 years old selling my stuff on eBay. So back then my standards were like, let's right. just draw a naked chick and make some money as quick as I can. So my old stuff is fucked up. It worked out well for me. Though. But that was how <laughs> that was my way of training, you know? And and I could see the more time I spent, the more quality uh I would the more how do you say that in English? Like the, more, <laughs> the 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 better quality my product was, the better it it seemed to please the the, the audience and sell better. So you know that's how you start building uh, your skills. It's the maturing process as an artist. We mm -hmm. do this as human beings all the time. We don't think about it as artists yeah. sometimes, but it's just part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Right. So. So, but there, there's awarenesses to be gleaned here, right? Because like when you realize that when you produce better art, it's sold better. Right. Yeah. I mean, also it depends because sometimes the economy is shit. There's not too many customers sometimes. around because it depends what time of the year, you know, it is and all that. So sometimes you will do your masterpiece and you're like, oh, this is going to sell so good. And then nobody wants it. Yeah, sometimes there's a fucking plague. <laughs> but at least you've given your best, you know, and this is a picture you can keep for your portfolio, do prints of it, you know, or show uh, during conventions and things like that. At some point, your ego is going to get hit a little hard in that yeah. process. But again, it's part of that journey. Sure. So was there a point for, for either one of you? And Chris, in a minute, I want to talk specifically about your RPG industry experience, because that was, that was originally my target market when I said I was going to start to be a professional artist. Right. Um, but, uh, well, shit, now I've lost my original question. Let's go ahead with that. 
<laughs> I'm winging it, folks. I'm flying without I've a net. Learned. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, the, the things that you learn along the way about how to run the business, right? How to interact with the clients, those are skills that don't necessarily come from looking at your anatomy books. They don't come from experimenting with color, right? Like learning how to deal with a client and, and keep that client aware of, exp uh, you know, manage their expectations, deliver good product, deliver on time. That's a whole different skill set. It is. Can, can you talk about that skill set and how you acquired it? Because I mean, if you're working in the, in the RPG industry, you're working on deadlines, right? What helped me the most was actually conventions. And because for if that weekend of time, that two, three days, whatever it is, now your client is directly in front of you in person. This is not email. You have to humanize your buyer now. Now, in the art field, so many of us get used to everything being done over private message or email, and that digitizes that component, and you don't think of it the same way. But at a convention, as you're sitting there doing your sales, your sales are right in front of you. And you now have to develop people skills. Yeah. <laughs> and you either do or you don't. Yeah, in an email, there's no body language or, you know, voice tone or anything like that. When, so. you, when you go to a convention, how many artists are hiding behind their table wishing they weren't there? <laughs> you can tell which ones they are. When you walk past them, their heads are down, yeah. they're doodling, they're, they're doing. and they, they glance up, up like this, like, ah, crap, someone's there. And, <laughs> and then it's like, hi. Yeah, and then, know, but the reality is you don't is, want to bother them. You're like, I, yeah. I'll just buy nothing, buy bitches. And like, a lot of people are uncomfortable buying from that because, yes. well, it's just it's awkward. So if you create an awkward situation, you get awkward buyers. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to, what I ran into was you have to just politely and not even fishing for a sale to say, hey, I hope you're enjoying the convention today. How are you today? And you just give a damn about how their experience is at that show because if they have a good show they're more likely to express that by purchasing things for their walls that they can live with and enjoy and appreciate with a happy memory and it's while that's business it's also just making sure they enjoy a good time and enrich their life with hopefully some artwork so it can coincide and that comes back to then the gaming design where you take that now home and you say well that's my audience still you know and through that process, you're developing people skills, and it will mix and mingle into a professional device, which is now functional. So, so this is cool. You actually intuited a, a, a piece of education that's part and parcel of other worlds, right? So if you're working in sales or if you're working in any kind of public-facing role, um, one of the things that you'll learn, and it's probably in the book, How to Make Friends and Influence People, right? But like, there's this very simple phrase that says, interested is interesting. Right. Being interested in other people makes you interesting. Right. True. And like that was the thing. If somebody's approaching your table and you have the sole goal of selling them your shit, that's a vibe that comes across. That's an energy that's like, yeah. oh, that's that's push energy. Right. Yeah. You know, used car salesman doesn't work. Right. Yeah. So there's a difference between push and pull. Right. Yeah. Between inviting someone in and saying, hey, how you, how's your show going so far? Are you guys having a good time? I'd right. rather they don't buy my things and have a great time than buy my things and forget about them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That matters. No, and, and that's a great point of view. Um, I'm going to tell you a story here, and this is not to knock anybody, and it's not in, in, in a place of judgment, but what you were talking about, holy shit, if you could see the size of the iguana, um, it's like four feet long. It's like <laughs> this fucking big. Neat. South Florida. Yeah. All right. <laughs> And with all the, the social distancing going on right now, like all of the animals are out in the forest. We had a giant turtle. There's been like, there's, there was a rabbit who just sat and looked at me the other day. Like normally rabbits see humans Disney and run. <laughs> I'm like, ooh. <laughs> I like that. All right. So anyway, this happened to me a couple of times and I'm only gonna name one of the artists by name. Um, but uh, I had an opportunity, I think it was at Miami Comic-Con where I got to, I got to meet, or I got, <laughs> I got to approach James O'Barr of, of the Crow fame. Okay. Um, now the Crow was huge for me, right? Like I love the story. I love the artwork. I, I love the tragic storytelling. I love the movie that they made of it. I, lo I loved everything about it. 
And there's James O'Barr at a six foot table, just like any other Joe or Jane. And I'm like, what's he doing there? He's James O'Barr. Shouldn't he be on a throne somewhere? Or shouldn't he be in like, 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 like a bulletproof box, like the Pope? Like, how does this work? How is James O'Barr <laughs> sitting where I could get to? Him? Like, how does that work? That's not right. right. And I feel the same way every time that I see David Mack or Adam Hughes or like, so like, why are you like people? You're not like people. No, isn't it? I felt that way with Brahm. <laughs> I felt like that with that real more. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So, it's, so anyway, James O'Barr is sitting there and he's doing like a Copic commission for somebody. And it's not even of the crow. It's like somebody has asked James O'Barr to draw something that wasn't the crow. And first of all, I want to go and find them and smack them. Because what are you thinking? <laughs> right? But second, the reason why I'm talking about this because exactly what, what you were talking about. He's sitting there at the table working on commissions that he picked up at the show. And so when I came up and I'm like, excuse me, are you James O'Barr? And he like looked up for a second. He's like, yeah. And then went back to drawing. <laughs> and I'm like, Hi, I'm a huge, like I never, I didn't even know what he looked like. I'd never know. I was like, yeah, I'm so, such a big fan of your work. And he's like, yeah, thanks. Cool. And like kept drawing. <laughs> ah. And, yeah. and I'm like, yeah. and so like, for, for, like, I understand the gig, right? I, I, I get it. You're at the show and somebody handed you cash and I didn't, but like, I'm like, I'm standing there, man. <laughs> right. And like, I was like, I kept trying to engage and, and like the third time he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I've got somebody coming back for this in a couple of minutes, but you can keep talking. Yeah. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to talk at you. Okay, right. I, I wanted to talk with you. I that's your experience, and you'll remember it. Oh yeah, and I remember it, and I talk about it, right? right? And this is not to knock James O'Barr. Obviously, he probably had a stack of commissions that he oh, had to get sure. done before the weekend, right? This is not a judgment, but I'm relating this as a customer experience of somebody right. who was a, who was a longtime fan, who had a less than awesome encounter with with yeah. somebody. It matters. Um, it does matter. Right. David Mack, on the other hand, every time I see that guy, David Mack is shaking hands with people, engaging with people, inviting them to to look through the offerings. But like he's willing to answer any questions. And like now and then he'll stand at the table and do these like uh, these uh, ink brush, like the like not not like sumier, but like like that. Right. He'll do these like quick ink things that are just like mind blowing. Right. But he's talking the whole time. Right. Now it's a show. Right. And it's, it's a, it's a very different experience. And like, I think that um, I, I've encountered more artists than I can count who have given me the James O'Barr experience and not the David Mack experience. I've learned a lot from conventions, Yeah, you know, and you know, I don't even go to them much anymore, but I still al almost daily go back to the lessons that I've learned from them. And, you know, my first one was in 2005, 2004, 2005, That's somewhere in there. And, it, you know, I, I barely had anything of any real artistic value that, you know, that I would consider now, but back then was the best I could do. And I had all these big name artists right next to me. And man, you just feel like that big. And, but you know what? They treated me like an industry peer and they said, look, you're here. Yeah. You're you want your above. table. Yeah. Welcome aboard. And I have never forgotten. And that makes you now a part of the industry and you are now, you know, a herald of it. You know, you have to take care of it. We're all in this together. And uh, they taught me a lot that weekend. I, you know, I, I tell you, I think because judgment is so intrinsic in the work that I do as a coach. So many people function from places of judgment of either the judgment that they've already received or judgment that they don't want to receive, trying to avoid judgment at any cost. Right. And you, you got to give the merit badge to the artist community for being willing to be judged all the fucking time. Like, oh, yes. Right? Every time you oh, put a piece of art out there, it's kind of like, like you're not saying, what do you guys think of this? It's just like, here's my new art. And people are like, that's great. Or you know what? I think this could have been better. And you're like, I didn't ask. Right? <laughs> I just said, here's some art. Right? Yeah. No, you're going to get criti critiques from... Uh... Being an artist is a very vulnerable experience. Uh, yeah. An incredibly vulnerable experience, right? And, and it's, it, it fascinates me 
the strength that that engenders in us over time, right? There's, there's so many of us who like, you know, get knocked for our early work or even our, our current work, right? And like, it's easy to take that to heart and think that I suck at this. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not, I'm not showing anybody my art ever again, right? But that's never actually how it goes, right? You always come back, right? And there's, there's something intrinsic in that strength of willing to be seen, right? That, that lives and breathes in the art community in, in a place like no other. Right, like chefs are creative, but they hide in the kitchen. Nobody's cooking at the table except those Benny Hanna guys. <laughs> except Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> except Gordon, and you don't want him screaming in your face, right? That's why they put him in the kitchen. He didn't choose it. We put him in the kitchen. You stay in there. <laughs> A real element of this, though, that I really don't want to overshadow, is the mental health state of the art world, which is so many of us suffer from very low points of not only self-esteem, but just stability. Yeah, we face a lot of rejection, you know, um, a lot of rejection when we try to, you know, uh, be part of a, an art book, a project, a whatever, and, you know, rejection is a, it's, it's very uh, present. You We've know? had years, and, and, and I, mm. I don't say that lightly, actual years where we didn't want to produce much because of the depressive overload that comes in sometimes of, man, maybe I really shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, you, you got to push through and, you know, you want to sound positive and all that, but there are times and they can be long periods of time where you got to step back and uh, reassess. And, you know, okay, I so have a long history of depression and mental, just uh, low vibration, we'll say, yeah. and where I just don't function well. And uh, that's why I need her to help kind of, she helps keep me a little... <laughs> Uh, and I had to develop a meditation routine and, you know, all this, and you develop things that help you, but, you know, people are going to struggle. And that's one of the reasons that creates that camaraderie that you're talking about is so many of us go through this, that you have to kind of watch for your neighbor a little bit because without it, someone's going to go missing at some point and people are going to say, why didn't I see it coming? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this is gonna bring us, th this is, this is a, a, a pretty big circle that I'm gonna draw here, but there's a lot inside of it that relates to you two specifically. So bear with me while I kind of draw the map and then we can fill it in together. Um, you got it. So Do it. you two Let's met be. through the 78 Tarot Project. Uh-huh, yes. You met on opposite sides of the same country. <laughs> yes. You're now yes. in the same room. We're gonna talk about that in a second. <laughs> Okay. What is our director? Worked great. Sometimes you're in the same room without clothes on. We're going to talk about that too, because there's no holds barred here. So, but the, the, the part, part of this is that when you relocated, Chris, from Washington, right? Yeah. So Washington to North Carolina, and you guys were finally united. And I can't say reunited. I think you'd only met once before. We had met basically twice before because twice we, before, yeah, mm -hmm. right. But then you make this huge life choice. Bravo to you, right? Bravo to both of you for having the courage to do Show that. The up. When you look at our choices, <laughs> <laughs> we have a history of extremely poor judgment. Judging by where things go, this was the one that made the most sense. <laughs> Say like, what else can happen at this point? This, this was the choice that was, yeah, this was the choice that was least like drinking battery acid. Let's go with it. Um, so, <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but, okay, so I'm tying this into to mindset here because living in, in a state of financial and health ins insecurity and instability, right? That's the artist life, right? Especially if you live in, a country where there's no socialized medicine, right? Where like, you could be an artist all you want, but if you get sick, well, that was your choice, bro. Right? Like, I mean, I come from Canada, so I've, I've lived both sides of it, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, I just came back, for people who don't know me, I just came back from living in Italy for three years. So I, I, I've experienced a very different way of life. Um, yeah. So my, my point of view about this is, is kind of strong and I'm not going to try to force it on you, but, um, but 
mindset is is key here in staving off depression and anxiety and and the stressors of financial instability because it's feast or famine sometimes. Oh yeah, often. <laughs> so now Chris <laughs> So now Chris you had a Patreon. Um you had a Patreon page and um, when you moved to North Carolina, you kept it going for a little while, and then financial realities being what they were, you chose to shut it down. Can you talk about that decision for me? My decision was based on the fact that I was not, I was no longer able to deliver the quality of content I was promising. And there's a point where you have to be real with yourself. And, you know, I've kept a very, it's been a couple of years now, fairly sturdy practice of self awareness. I'm a practicing Buddhist at this point, for better or worse. I mean, I'm not the best at it. I'm I'm an American. We're not built that way here. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but still eat meat. <laughs> but I do what I can to try and be aware about what I'm bringing to the situation. It's I am not a victim of my circumstances. I'm just in circumstances. And there's this point where we were having enough problems making rent where I needed to go get a day job. And with that day job, I did try and keep the Patreon going for about a month, month yeah. and a half, and it was torture. Yeah. I could not do everything. Yeah, you feel like you're being an asshole because you cannot give what you, 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 you promised, you know, and these people. So. Until I can fulfill those promises, I will not take it live again. Yeah. And I look forward to taking it live again. I want that. I yeah. want to connect with people. But if I can't do it the right way, I don't do yeah, it. I don't want to take advantage of people. Just be, oh, that, that's cool. They're supporting us, but it's like you have to money. deliver. Yeah, you know, it's not free money. They're no. they're giving you kindness and time and their attention, and you fulfill it or you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. People will remember that. So the um, one of the reasons why I circle back around to this the other night, I had a very long talk with Heather Hitchman. Um, I'm not sure you know Heather. Uh, yeah. of, uh, and she has hard. she has a world that she's building called Teraton. And she's getting a little plug here now. And she's going to appear on the show in two weeks. Um, hey. So that's cool. teasing that one coming soon. Heather R. Hitchman of Teratov. Um, so, <laughs> but the I thing have, of it is, is that well, there are times where I could not remember an artist's name, but I remember the property that was theirs, right? Um, I still don't know how to pronounce Iris's last name of Fairies of the Fort, uh, Fairies of Iris, the Fault Lines. Um, Compete. Com Compiet? Is it compiet or is it just get things. Right, but, but I don't know. That's my point, right? But I know fairies of the fault lines. I know her property, right? It's great Sam, work. Yeah. It's phenomenal work, right? One Sam the, Hogg's work on her Whaler Girl series. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the best person I've worked with. Uh, she was one of the artists at 78 Tarot. And, uh, she, Iris? She, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I was. Oh you have to go look back in the previous text. <laughs> That's <laughs> so cool. Did a judgment card yeah. and. Uh, but the reason why I bring this up is because Heather Hitchman's got Teratoff, Sam Hogg has Whaler Girl, Iris has Fairies of the Fault Line, and you've got Penguin Lost. <laughs> yes. Penguin. Motherfucker! I swear to God, if you don't fucking put pencil to paper again and give me more Penguin Lost, I'm gonna come over there and and. I, I'm gonna rip. I'm gonna. T I'm gonna put my face through your top hat. I'm just gonna smash it. All right. Smash I'll, it. I'll smack. I'll smack him with oh, my claws. Do you want some good news? Yes. I've. I've I'm pregnant. No. <laughs> I've gotten so much more story developed in the time that I haven't been able to draw. That I know that, you know, number one, I am getting back to it very shortly on this. But number two, it's gonna be a better product for it. And so even taking almost a year off from it, which sucks because I want to work on this. Yeah. I love this project. Um, the reality is, is that now I know it can be a better product. And uh, I, I, I got to say that like, you know, my, my experience with you as an artist has, uh, has always been stellar. Um, my experience with you as, as, as a kind of art mentor has been wonderful. Um, okay. but, but all of your stuff with Penguin Lost kept surprising me with your vision and the scale and the scope of it. It's such a gorgeous piece of work. That and it's bigger than people would expect. Um, yeah. I, I've I, developed whole mythology to this now. And I think now that with that world building, it's going to be really, really interesting. It's fun. really fucking weird. <laughs> like I get to know all the stories and like when he creates a new, a new characters, and I'm like, 
what the fuck? I don't know I, half of it yet. But then that's so cool because I don't know. It's just so, so unique. We, Weird. Like him. I have this belief we need absurdity in our lives. You know, we need a little bit of weird because we are as rationalized creatures trying to make sense of everything. And sometimes we can't. So what if we just pursue that a little bit? Yeah, who the you know? hell can make penguins look badass? I mean, they try. They, they're it's, they're it's badass. They're all like. It's, a, it's an epic penguin space opera. <laughs> it's it's I phenomenal. Ra- I, was, I was raised on science fiction from like the 50s and 60s. You know, I mean, pulp novels, you know, quick little, you know, cheap novels. They're so fun. And they're, half of them are not written terribly well. But it's escapism at its best to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's the era of Conan, for example, and Solomon Kane. And we get all these cheap little adventures of off-world fun and hijinks. And I wanted to bring that to maybe a slightly more modern audience, but keeping the same energy to it. I got to tell you, except, I, you know, I'm sure that the audience is asking <laughs> the same question. People who don't, who don't know you guys personally, who don't know your backstory. And we we're, we're, we can discuss this more in the lightning round coming soon. Like right after this interview, we're going to do a lightning round. But for the people who don't know you guys, you you seem like this really kind of calm, contemplative, meditative, zen <laughs> kind of like kung fu Buddhist motherfucker, and she's like a coked out harlequin on roller skates. How do you guys end up together? Yeah, I look like Rainbow Bright had sex with Megatron while Skeletor was watching in the corner. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, that's not right. <laughs> Balance. <laughs> Balance. Okay. Whew. Uh, so you'd both just gone so far in one direction. It was like, I need, I need, so, there's got to be something. <laughs> the funny I tend thing. to do that. The funny thing is that on the outside, we're drastically different people. On the inside, our foundation of what makes us us is very similar. Yeah. And we found, you know, years ago, I mean, to bring it back kind of where you were kind of going a little while ago with us being, diff, you know, distanced, is we had long discussions and realized we had so much in common. Yeah. And not even then just like, hey, I like the same movies as you. You know, <laughs> we were raised in very similar ways, even a country apart. Yeah. And it gave us a lot that we knew we yeah. could build Even on. Even with the, the language barrier and all that, he was one of the person that I could communicate with with no problem. We had the same height, if that makes sense, you know? So uh, Communication doesn't have to be a language. Mm-hmm. Communication can exist outside of that as long as you just want to understand someone. Yeah. So. Yeah, now, now you're talking my language, right? Because, like, people who... <sighs> I, I, I hear the word argument a lot. I hear people fight. And, and the thing that, that, I, that one of the best relationship tools I took away from the last number of years was that if you're, if you're talking to win an argument, everybody loses. But if you're talking to understand, yeah, everybody exactly. gets to win, right? Um, we, we really have never had a fight. <laughs> we just want to understand the other person better. And then we do. And yeah. then you do. And we just talk, right? talk, 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 talk. We'll disagree but, with a few things, but it's never heated. It's just, I see things slightly different, and that's okay. Okay, yeah, we're coming up on the hour mark here. I'm going to ask you both a question. Um, I want you to Ooh. both answer your, your own answers to this, okay? So what is your favorite thing about living with another artist? And what is your least favorite thing about living with another artist? <laughs> Delphine, you first. My favorite thing about living with another artist, well, that's the first time for me because, you know, <laughs> previous partners were not artists. And um, uh, at first I was like, a artist, they're so, they're so weird, right? <laughs> Why would I want to be with one of them? <laughs> My favorite thing, uh, he understands me. Like artists, they have such a special way to, you know, see things. We, uh, emotionally you know like we are both amazed by you know the way the moon looks like outside you know while some people are like oh, okay yes yeah, that's a shiny ship in the in the sky so, awesome <laughs> we're very sensitive we're both very you know sensitive and uh, i don't know also being with another artist it's great because each time you want to to 
to to know how uh, your art worker working on looks like i'm like hey dude can you can you tell me what you think also sometimes i cannot draw skeletons fine <laughs> well so he, he will draw the skeletons <laughs> for me <laughs> so wait no. do, you, do you find uh, i'm sorry to interrupt but do, do you find artists on the whole to be more emotionally available I, from what the experience yes yeah i mean in your experience that's, that's all you have to go on right so yeah, yeah. i mean has that been your your experience far and wide with artists that you've dealt with because you were the art director of the 78 tower you dealt with a lot yeah. of artists. oh being an art director right director for that project was uh, a, a lot like being a psychologist <laughs> for all these motherfuckers uh, because people comes to you with the, oh, you know, here's why I couldn't, you know, uh, be on time for my deadline. And then you start, you know, being uh, this person who gets to hear everybody's stories. So, uh, whew. <laughs> yes, like you. I, I was that guy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, well, when you deal with 78 artists every single year, uh, a lot of excuses. it can be a <laughs> so that's some bullshit. No. But to, to, yeah, to come back to uh, the original question, my favorite thing about, you know, living with another artist, again, is we're both speaking the same language emotionally and sensitively. Okay. And, uh, you know, again, okay. it's cool. now, now the other question, your together. least favorite part. What's your least favorite part? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I just, you can never find an eraser when you need one, or what? How does this work? I, but that's great. Like we have twice the art supplies, you know. <laughs> that's fucking cool, dude. Like we can share everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, my, no, I mean, it, it's. I I honestly cannot find anything that I find. I mean, maybe we've struggled financially, obviously, because it's not a stable income, you know, to mm -hmm. uh, just draw things and sell them. But now he's had, you know, a, this fabulous day job. <laughs> but I mean, it's hard to make it two artists together when we're just starting from pretty much from scratch, you know, after this big move that we did together. But there's nothing that I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, he's an artist. Like, no, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, and I gotta, I gotta give mad props to Chris here on this thing because, like, it would have been one thing to like go out and just like get a job at like Home Depot lugging lumber and stuff, but like. And instead, he, he went and got this job, which you had some minor experience in, but like this was not like where your, your wheelhouse was, right? The experience was so minor that it barely counts. Um, you know, like in high school, I'd taken a little bit of drafting classes, and now I'm drafting. And the reality is most people that you will ever run into in the drafting field went to a college for it. This is not a simple process. And to learn how to do it digitally kind of on the fly takes a level of concentration that even I'm struggling to find some days. It's right. I mean, this, this was not amateur hour when you walked in and not only did you get in there and did you make it work like every day on that job has been like the dread pirate Roberts talking to Wesley going, good night, Wesley. Good job. Most likely kill you in the morning. Like it's <laughs> like you've been on the verge of death the entire time and yet you're still there. And so many other people have been let go. Um, yeah, well, and the background of this company, I don't want to, I, I can only go so far on this because of yeah, non-disclosure, yeah. but the company started running into um, issues with uh, its own income because they were running out of a contract. This contract kind of got yanked out from underneath them, and that was how they were kept afloat. Um, you know, they got underbid by another company, and that's just how it goes sometimes. Now, over the winter, when there's less work for this company to do, obviously, the question is, who do we have to get rid of to keep ourselves afloat? Now, obviously, you look at the new guys. You do what you got to do, right? You know, the temps start looking a little nervous. <laughs> now, being the newest person at the company, of course, I'm thinking, crap, I got a job hunt at Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's not good. And, but I'm still there. And I'm the only temp still there at the moment. And I like to think it's a testament to trying to work hard and be a solution finder. So be, being your friend on Facebook and, and following this entire journey, I, I wanted to bring this up because it was, it was exactly the thing that makes you a professional artist that made you an asset to that company, which was your dedication to providing value. Right. Yes. And that's what, that's why you're still there. Right. Can I, if I, if I may real quick, last year there was a topic from another artist on Facebook 
uh, his name is Tristan Elwell. He's a huge presence in the art community. And if you were there for conceptart.org, you probably ran into the guy. We're probably even afraid of him. But the reality was that he was a bastion of knowledge. He had a huge amount of information to offer. And I followed his work since because I really like what he does. And he's very intelligent and just pleasant to talk to now. Now, the reality is, is that he has this approach, which some people find very intimidating. I find it very informative. Now, last summer, he made this topic and said, look, for the last time, a professional artist has nothing to do with making a full-time income as an artist. It's just being able to pay your damn rent and you get to make some pictures along the way. And the reality for him was that you just make it work. You know, we have this golden image in our heads of how we need it to be. And it's about expectation meeting reality is as a coach, I'm sure you've run into this. It doesn't match up, you know? Now, a lot of artists, it's like, if I'm not a full-time comic artist, I haven't made it. Yeah. If I'm not doing eight hours of painting, I haven't made it. Mm -hmm. And I have to work with her on that sometimes. You know, we expectation. I've always been a stay-at-home mom, too. So, like, it's difficult to, like, yeah. You know, do all the, the, the housework and take it's care hard. of the kids and be an artist. You know, so like. he was saying that to be a professional artist, you just have to be an artist and you're paying your rent. You're paying your bills. And congrats, you done it. And so I had to keep this in mind when I took on this drafting job. Mm. You know, I'm still an artist. I'm still creating things. Yeah. I've got contracts lined up still. Yeah, I, It's I, just not my full income. At first, I was like, wow, that sucks because we're both artists. And, you know, like yeah. he has to sacrifice, <laughs> you know, like I... You know, I was generating more uh, incomes with the art that I make because it's commissions. People, they all want their fucking pets to be painted. So that's just like, it worked great. But, you know, we weren't able to uh, make rent. So, it's stressful. And I felt like so, shit. I'm like, we're both artists. But then later he told me, you know, uh, to, be, to have a dream, uh, to have a dream to be a, uh, doesn't have to, to be a, about making, um, how did you say that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, to be successful doesn't mean that it has to be just with art. Like, to be able to provide, you know, for a little family is successful. Success for, for me is making sure we have a roof over our heads and her daughter has food, and you know, and making sure that our pets, you know, can sleep yeah. decadently on the bed while we and do that interviews. that doesn't mean that he has to make art for 20 hours a day right so hang on i got i i got to put a spotlight on this too because this is this is essential because this isn't a skill that that popped up right there are so many artists who have made the leap to try to do it full time and then when they have to go back to a day job where somebody else is paying them to count widgets right yeah. the feeling of failure is soul crushing yeah. right they Even feel like oh yeah Right. You know? But like, I think that you managed to combat here. that more than most. I, I yeah. think you managed to combat that more than most. I think that your mindset going into it was simply like, this isn't the whole story and this isn't the end of the journey. So this is something. I'm, and that was it. Right. Yeah. And it was, and, and you didn't make it more significant than that because when you make it significant that I failed at this, mm -hmm. that crushes so much inside you. And I was, I was proud to see you not do that. It's all perception. Right? We, yeah. We've gone way over here, and I want to talk to you for like another three hours. Like I, not way over, like seven minutes over. People We're will forgive ready. us for this. If any of you are and still you can watching, do another interview point, with us later. <laughs> troopers, thank you for for sticking around and continuing to watch us here. Sure. Um, you guys have been amazing. Thank you so much, Delphine. Thank you for for pushing me to do this and, and smacking me around and calling I'm me good Susan. At I don't know what that was all about. Um, so yeah, <laughs> you guys are amazing. I'm going to put your your links in the show notes um if there's a place that you want me to link to so people can book you for commissions uh I, please 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 Absolutely. put those links in there yeah. and um i'm gonna hit i'm gonna stop now and we're gonna say goodbye for the moment but people on the higher tiers are gonna get a lightning round of questions yeah yeah Bring some of it. which are really super weird i didn't come up with these questions <laughs> These are the questions I ask, and now we're going to see what other people ask. I'm just the conduit to the, we to the insanity <laughs> that's about to ensue. Yeah. Somebody was asking about Jesse, the dog's hair extensions, I think. It's going to get super weird. 
if you're not already a patron, that's, yeah, now that's get the true. lightning round. We'll see you there. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. It's been a pleasure. I've been your host, Frank Fridella, along with uh, Delphine de Vertemere. And <laughs> well, it was our pleasure to be there and take and uh, your, virgin, your virginity away <laughs> for being the <laughs> first. I, my, my virginity has certainly grown back at this point. I was glad to have it taken. So you guys be good. Be good to yourselves. Be excellent to each other. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.